Hey members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the Justice Committee. If members can do the needful with your electronic devices, with apologies from Linda Dillon and Emma Rogan, um, and everybody else is in attendance. And uh, I'll invite the clerk if she can indicate any members that have delegated their vote as per the appropriate standing order. Um, in accordance with standing order 1156, both Linda Dillon and Emma Rogan have delegated their votes to Gemma Dolan. Okay, thank you. Um, agenda item two is just the draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 9th of June. And if members are content that they are a true reflection of proceedings, then I shall sign them accordingly. Content? Content. Matters arising. Um, there's one item correspondence from the Committee on Education. Um, it's pages four to six of the table pack. On the 9th of June, the committee agreed that uh, it was content with the proposal to transfer the statutory function to make changes to the procedural regulations relating to special educational needs and disability tribunal from the Department of Education to the Department of Justice by way of a transfer functions order, and that was to be taken forward by the First and Deputy First Minister. Uh, the Committee for Education has now written to advise that it is generally content with the proposed transfer functions order being brought forward and has also provided a copy of a letter that it sent to the Department of Justice uh, requesting a range of information in respect of access to the Tribunal for Appealants and available guidance in respect of disability uh, matters. So that letter is there for members to note. Um, item 2 on matters arising, the Committee agreed to schedule a briefing by departmental officials on the UK's exit from the European Union and justice-related issues before summer recess and requested that sufficient time be identified for this. Having considered the options and ensuring there is sufficient time for the oral evidence session on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, and proposing that the briefing is scheduled on the afternoon of Thursday the 2nd of July. The committee will meet as normal in the morning. It will then break for lunch and then return for this briefing sessions. All other options um, haven't been feasible, so we're going to have to have two sessions on that Thursday morning and then afternoon. Members are content with that approach. Um, <coughs> the item four then is domestic abuse and family proceedings bill, further proposals for oral evidence. At our meeting on the 9th of June, the committee agreed to consider additional oral evidence sessions for the meetings of the 25th of June and the 2nd of July at today's meeting. Proposed oral evidence sessions outlined in the paper um, are, are outlined in a paper and uh, they are based on proposals that have been submitted from members, taking account then of the time available um, to members in order then to hear as wide a range of views as possible and to hear from organisations that are making specific points or raising issues that are not covered by other organisations. Um, the issues raised in all the written submissions can be referred um, to the Department for a written response to assist the Committee when uh, considering uh, them. So can I thank uh, Christine and the, the staff for the work they've done in terms of providing a summary of all of the evidence. It's been very helpful, um, hopefully, to members to have got that summary of each individual submission. Um, all of the submissions where there are issues being raised, where we don't cover them in oral evidence sessions, um, as outlined, we will uh, seek written responses um, from the department. But we've sought to try and get oral evidence sessions now arranged um, where we can look at specific areas that are being highlighted by organisations. And so there are proposals there for members now uh, to uh, consider. Also in the paper, it outlines uh, informal and private meetings that are going to be held with individuals that have came forward with their stories and um, arrangements will be put in place for them to be able to share uh, with committee members uh, in respect of that issue. Um, in order to get some balance as well on it, um, if members are content, committee staff will approach Women's Aid and Men's Advisory Project to identify uh, other individuals who would be willing to meet with committee members. So members, if you're um, content with the approach around um, identifying other individuals and also the uh, private informal meetings that we'll have, then I'm happy to have a discussion around the uh, oral evidence sessions, um, which is in the meeting pack. Um, Yeah, sorry, that was email. that was emailed round members, wasn't it, Christine? Also, did. yeah. Sorry, so you should have a hard copy of it there. So for Thursday, the twenty fifth of June, um, Cara Friend here and I Rainbow Project, Evangelical Alliance, and the Migrant Centre 
and then on the 2nd of July, the Bar um, of Northern Ireland Public Prosecution Service and the Human Rights Commission, um, having looked at what members had been seeking and trying to get a, a balance. So I'm happy to, I know Rachel, you'd suggested a number of them. Um, obviously in all of this, it's you're not able to take everybody in to fit it into the time frame that we're doing, but where we have evidence that we don't then get covered, um, you know, because we're having next week victim support, we're going to hear from the NSPCC, we're going to hear from Bernardo's uh, in terms of um, children aspects of it too, um, then that should be covering as broad a range of the evidence that people have provided. A lot, a lot of the submissions are highlighting similar themes that have been identified um, and we've sought to pick out the best ones that, that can provide the best evidence to committee members. So that, that's the proposed way forward by way of oral evidence sessions. Joe, so can I just ask, uh, and I've no issue with this by the way, um, but we have Cara Friend here and I in the Rainbow Project as a one group. Have we approached them to say that would they be happy to come in as a one group? What I, what I wouldn't want them is to feel like we're just group, grouping them all together because they may cover this from a different angle. Uh, and we haven't got in this, and I see there's no submission from them anyway, but it might be a consideration. Um, Gender NI as well. Who, who aren't down there, but if we're looking at that sort of sector, it might be just worth exploring it. Bearing in mind, of course, and I absolutely get limited time, yeah. um, but I'm just wondering, certainly on this point here, are they happy to come in? Are we going to ask them? We haven't approached them yet, but we always do approach them on the basis that the committee is suggesting this. If they're not happy, then we'll come back to you. And, and I don't have a problem with that. I just, you know, as, long as, as long as they don't have an issue, because I wouldn't want them to think that we've just grouped them together yes. you know, uh, and nobody else has been grouped. Yeah, well, if you're content, Christine can tease out with them that we're trying to have this session cover this aspect of the evidence, and, and hopefully there isn't any issues, but if there are, yeah, of course, okay. we'll accommodate that. I mean, we did <coughs> the same with NSPCC and Bernardo's. We approached them, and they were content that they're coming yeah. together, but obviously if they're not, we'll come back to you. Okay. Or we'll split and try and do two sessions that might be slightly shorter. Yeah. Because I think if, if we do separate sessions we generally tend to cover some of the same stuff yeah. in each and that takes longer so we're saying to them then they probably get shorter time um but we'll accommodate whatever we can it makes absolute sense to me and i guess that's a, you know there's no issue there but just making sure that, that there won't be something that comes back and bites at a later stage sorry did, did you want us to go back to gender ni well, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I'm really putting it to, to the chair and to, to the committee. You know, do, do we look at gender and I? It's very specific. It's very different and very specific. There's, um, there's some it, submissions. There's some organisations I thought would made a submission that haven't. Yeah. In, in other aspects as well, and there's some that have made submissions that are quite scant on detail, which yeah. I thought would have been a little bit more um, beefed out in terms of what what they have provided. So I suppose that's. Like all of these things, it's wor where do you draw the line oh, in absolutely. terms of um, pursuing organisations and individuals to provide you more evidence, and oh, that's, of course. that's the challenge, I suppose. Should you need? Yeah, Chair, I just, on a, in a similar vein, I have no problem with this, but um, maybe reaching out to organisations, because this is the time to get a full a picture as we can. And I'm thinking of um, elder abuse, and the, I think they're called Hourglass now, I think they've rebranded. Yeah, we wrote to them. So I, I don't know if there's any submission from them, and also from, um, you know, in that light that we're taking it across the age profile. So Bernardo's, that is reassuring to know. But thank you, Chair. Yeah, both of um, definitely our glass were on the stakeholder list, and we sent them, we wrote to them, inviting evidence. Um, it was one of the gaps we'd highlighted. Um, I was a bit surprised we had. Repeat, this commissioner did write in, but the submission is is limited. Okay. Um, Broadly, because of the comment, is about a more comprehensive piece of legislation to tackle elder abuse. Um, but in terms of us picking out specific to this, um, it is limited, um, in, in my view, on, in terms of what the submission is. I mean, if, if it would be helpful, what we could do is go back to those organisations you've both mentioned um, and indicate that if they wanted to put in any written evidence, even at this stage, the committee would be happy to receive it and see whether we get something in writing. At least then you would have in writing any points you want to raise. We could try that if you, if you want. Okay. Okay, members, then go forward on the basis of the paper as outlined um, by the clerk.
Item 5, um, Criminal Finances Act 2017, pages 12 to 54 of the meeting pack and also 8 to 9 of the table pack. And the committee considered the Minister's proposal to ask the Home Office to commence the devolved provisions um, in the Criminal Finances Act of 2017 at our meeting on the 20th of May. We requested a range of issues from the Department to assist consideration of proposals. The committee also wrote seeking the views of the Policing Board and the proposals uh, on the proposals and also to the FMDFM regarding the mechanism that can be put in place to establish the views uh, or consent of the Assembly in this scenario and whether there are other similar acts across all departments. The Minister has replied providing information requested, advising that there is no predetermined protocol to seek the retrospective consent of the Assembly once Parliament has legislated on devolved matters and confirming that she has not had any objections to her proposals from ministerial colleagues. She has indicated that she believes that a compelling case to commence the relevant um, provisions and therefore intends to issue a written ministerial statement to the Assembly and write to the Home Office no later than Friday the 9th of June, 19th of June. Um, seeking commencement of provisions for, the Nor for Northern Ireland, and she also asked officials to make arrangements to provide an annual update to the committee on the use of the powers in the Act. The Policing Board responded, indicating that it was supportive of the extension, uh, the extension of this legislation to Northern Ireland as soon as possible. The Executive Office has not yet uh, responded. So, members, it's it's obviously there now for us to note. Um, the minister has outlined the the procedures. Um, we have raised our issue around the process and we're waiting for the Executive Office. Um, I think that'll be interesting to see how they respond. But in a nutshell, the Minister for Justice has the powers to, to commence these and there's no formal mechanism for the Assembly to give its consent or otherwise. And that's the current position. So um, we'll note the information. Okay. Similarly, item six in the same vein, um, the crime... Overseas Production Orders 2019, Commencement on Devolved Provisions Relating to Northern Ireland. Uh, the Committee considered the Minister's proposal to ask the Home Office to commence the devolved provisions in the Crime Act 2019 at our meeting of the 20th of May. We requested further information um, from the Department. The Committee also wrote to the Policing Board and FMDFM around the scrutiny mechanism proposal. Minister's replied providing the information requested, confirming that there's been no responses um, to her proposals from ministerial colleagues, also indicating default provisions are inextricably linked to the expected and reserved matters in the legislation and seeks to introduce primary legislation in the Assembly to cover the devolved aspects uh, as not being a viable option. Um, she believes that there is a compelling case to commence the relevant uh, provisions and therefore intends to issue a written ministerial statement to the Assembly writing to the Home Office no later than again Friday the 19th of June to seek commencement of provisions for Northern Ireland. The Placing Board responded, indicating that it was supportive of the Minister's proposal to commence the provisions of the Act relevant to Northern Ireland, and that response is in uh, Members' packs. The Executive Office has not yet uh, responded. So again, Members, as per the previous item, it's there for the Committee to note the procedures being in place, and the Minister will make a written ministerial statement on the issue before Friday the 19th of June. Um, item 7, UK-wide <coughs> regulations um, in respect of containing Northern Ireland's alignment to the making available on the market and supervision of explosives for civil use under Directive 2014-28 EU. The Minister has written outlining that under the Northern Ireland Protocol, Northern Ireland is uh, required to maintain alignment with EU regulations in relation to explosive, civil explosives, which is the making available on the market and supervision of explosives for use directive. Um, as part of the UK-wide preparations for a no-deal EU exit, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy took forward the EU exit regulations, which included amendments to MAMSTER. Don't ask me to hmm. tell you what that acronym is. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, oh, right, OK. <laughs> Thanks. Um, which, now needs to, which now need to be reserved to ensure continued alignment with the directive. Um, as Mamster contains a mix of devolved and reserved provisions, which would be very difficult to separate, the Minister has agreed that UK-wide regulations be brought forward by the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Department as being the most practical way of reversing the Mamster amendments. So again, members, it's there for information to note, unless there's more clarity needed. Noted. Okay. Item 6. Uh, item 8, sorry. Um, 
in respect of personal injury discount rate. The proposed consultation, uh, Northern Ireland is the only uh, legal jurisdiction in the UK in which the discount rate still has to be set under an unamended damages act and in accordance with the principles in Wales v Wales. The Department of Justice therefore intends to undertake a consultation on whether or not the legal framework for setting the personal injury discount rate should be changed and if so, how. The Department has indicated that changing the discount um, rate uh, is set would require primary legislation and subject to the outcome of consultation. The Minister is considering the possibility of bringing forward legislation in the autumn. The consultation will run for eight weeks and the par Department has provided a copy of the draft uh, consultation document. So, members, um, it's just that uh, for us to note that we're content with the proposed consultation. We will then consider the matter whenever that consultation process has concluded. Members content to note item 9. June monitoring round. The Department has sent a copy of the Department's monitoring round returns that were recently completed and submitted to the Department of Finance. The Department has submitted one bid, which is for the police service, and there is one reduced uh, requirement related to the temporary resting place. Uh, further information is expected on the COVID-19 exercise commissioned by the Department of Finance in addition to responses to questions submitted by the Committee on the 9th of June. And If members are content, then we will note the information on the June monitoring round and we will consider if any further information or an oral briefing from departmental officials is required once that additional information has been received. Members content to note. Yeah, just, yes, sorry, yeah, Paul. Content, but content, of course. But just to say again, to echo that the, the way that we're doing this now with regards to monitoring and scrutinising, and we can see right across all the departments. I can't sorry on the finance committee, but it's there for public use, and public sight, and it's it's the best way of doing it in my eyes since I've been here, and it's it's good that we can have some sort of uniformity across budgetary matters. Great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Correspondence. Um, there are six items of correspondence. Um, I'll draw attention to, to three of them. Um, item one is correspondence from the Minister providing an update on the ongoing engagement with the UK Government at both ministerial and official level on the Counter Terrorism and Sentencing Bill and copies of her correspondence with the Lord Chancellor on the matter. The papers were received yesterday and they've been circulated. Uh, two members in the table pack for information today. Um, we'll place this item on the agenda uh, for consideration at our meeting next week uh, when members have had an opportunity to, to consider it. Members are content with that. Item two is correspondence from an individual uh, regarding the approach of the police to placing the Black Lives Matter protests and the issuing of fines. Um, members are agreed to reply to the individual advising that the policing board has responsibility for scrutinising operational matters in relation to the police and providing contact details for the board in that respect. And right. um, item three, um, again in the table pack, is correspondence from the Committee for Communities to all committees to share with their departments in relation to consideration of those with visual impairments when applying social distancing measures. Members are content with we'll forward that correspondence for the from the Department of Justice. And if members are content, then we'll action the other items of the correspondence as set out in the cover sheet um, by our event. I have no chairman's business. Is there any other business? Chair, I understand the Attorney General is leaving us. Are there any plans in place to replace him that you're aware of? Um, bar what I've read in the public domain. Yes. There was a written ministerial statement from the Executive Office, I think issued yesterday. Um, now, the Attorney General is here on Thursday in terms of Section 8 um, guidance and also uh, in respect of the domestic abuse bill. So, and that I suspect will be his last formal engagement with this committee and the Assembly. So, Can we ask the Minister then what plans there are to, in place to replace him? Yeah, I'm happy. I have no problem. I suspect we'll get the similar response that we've had from members that have tabled questions, but happy to, to write to the Executive Office asking what the procedures are for a replacement um, and obviously what the interim arrangements are going to be in the absence of an Attorney General. Um, yeah. If members are content, yeah, Rachel. Yeah, if I could just, um, out of just a process, can, can we have a situation where we do not have a sitting Attorney General? 
because it's my understanding that in 14 days the current Attorney General will be standing down and that there is no replacement. And the ministerial statement was quite clear yesterday and subsequent press release about that the process is ongoing and that there is a, a wealth of options being looked at. So I um, certainly would, would welcome to know what those options are. Um, but can we be in a situation here without an Attorney General? Um, we could find out what the rules are around appointments. Um, I've, ha I've had different informal advice that I think there is a duty placed upon the Executive Office to carry out appointment after a certain period of time. So, uh, but yes, I'm quite happy that we try and find out some more detail on that. Um, the office is one where I know members will have engaged with it on various issues, but one of the most significant ones I engaged with them on was around the Charities Commission. And also the Attorney General's office would have intervened on quite a significant number of civil liberty issues around um, uh, detainment and so on under mental health um, legislation. Um, and there are certain things that only the Attorney General can initiate. And so I think there are questions here around how long could this be that we may not have a post holder and what could that mean in terms of functions of that office. So I'm quite happy that the committee would write to the executive office. We had a particular relationship with the office given that it's this committee that lays, the, the Attorney General would have laid all of the Section 8 guidance around human rights, around the criminal justice and any assembly business, it was always this committee that would have had to have dealt with that because the AG doesn't have a, a role in assembly plenary sessions. So I think this committee does have a particular interest around the office of the Attorney General and I'm happy for the, the committee to, to write to the Executive Office asking what are the interim arrangements, uh, what's the time frame um, and what measures are, are being put in place to, to fulfil the functions of that office and any legal obligations that the Executive Office is under to, to carry out that appointment process. Also, Chair, if I could add to that, I'd agree uh, with Rachel on this. So I think we need to be clear in our mind what the consequences are uh, for Assembly business if we don't have an Attorney General. Now, I know it's you know very much an advisory role, but I don't know if there's a function, a statutory function for him in, in, in passage of legislation, say, for instance. I don't know, but it'd be, I think it'd be coming on us to find out what the consequences would be of the Assembly not having an Attorney General in post. My understanding is there is a rule. You know, even in the introduction of domestic abuse, the Attorney General has advised around this extra territorial dimension, and that's why we're taking evidence from him on it. And there's also a role at the end of the process by way of that's true. Or, legal competence yeah. of the Assembly when it has passed legislation, and also referral to the Supreme Court on points of law. Very rare that that ever happens. In fact, I'm not sure it has. I think there's only been one case in the last 10 years, but nevertheless, there. There's quite a range of different functions to the office, and yeah, I'm also kind of royal assent maybe too, maybe channel the conduit for which we get royal assent. Certainly, is at the I know from the, at the end of an assembly legislative process, the attorney general has a has a formal role, um, to make sure that we've legislated within our competence and compliant with human rights and so on. So, Christine, have you got a broad enough? Remit as to what we want to ask. Yes. All of. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I'm just not. We'll write to the executive office and we'll cover all of those things. Um, if the committee is content, I may um, make inquiries about specifically the assembly because we may need to write to somebody within here about the implications for the assembly. I'm not 100% sure. So if you're happy enough, we'll take advice on that, and if necessary, we'll write to them as well to cover that point. Okay, well then, members, we're, we're scheduled to meet on Thursday. Uh, it's 10 o'clock. Again, apologies for late notice. It's a slightly earlier start um, so that we can complete our business um, in case there's an ad hoc committee. And also, members, uh, again, if you're content, we'll schedule a meeting for today week at 1 p.m. because there's a number of written briefings that need to be considered next week, and that will allow the Thursday the 25th meeting to focus on the bill evidence. And again, I'll seek to have the meeting concluded 
um, within 30 minutes if members are agreeable. Great. Great. Okay, Great. thank you, members. Thank Meeting you. adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.